Oh, y'all look good. I want you to look at something right now. Think of some major goal you want, or maybe it's one you're already working on, and you have experienced a lot of setbacks, a lot of defeats. You've experienced a lot of disappointment. Maybe you've already given up. And maybe you just need a little fire, a little encouragement to get back in the game again. Here's what I want you to look at. There are winners, and there are losers, and there are people who have not discovered how to win. And all they need is some coaching. All they need is some help and assistance, just a little support. All they need is some insight or a different strategy or plan of action to make some adjustments that will open up the key to a whole new future for them, that will give them access to the unlimited power that they have within themselves. That's all that they need. So what I want you to do is, is think about something you want for you, that's real for you, that's important for you, that will give your life some special meaning and power. And I don't even want you to say, I can do that. I don't want you to assume that. See, five years ago, when I started out in this area, I would not have been able to make the mental leap that I would be up to where I am right now. I don't want you to begin to just psych yourself out. No, no. I want you to be able to say something to yourself that will enable you to maintain a level of integrity with yourself. That when you say this, even when you face tremendous setbacks, it, it will be a benchmark to keep you in the game, to keep you moving forward and experimenting and readjusting your strategy and your plan of action continuously, looking for ways to win. So what is that something? When you got an idea, you want to move on. You might not have the money, you might not have the education. You might not have the support or the resources you need. What is that something that can keep us going, that will enable us to act on our dream? What's one of those keys that will begin to help us to discover the secrets to our dream? Here's what I want you to repeat after me, please, with power and conviction. Say, it's possible. It's possible. That's all I want you to do when you look at your dream. You say to yourself every day, it's possible. You say that every day to yourself, it's possible. Because what does that do? See, it begins to change your belief system. See, the way in which we operate, ladies and gentlemen, it's a manifestation of what we believe, what's possible for us. Whatever you've done up to this point, all that it really is, is a duplication, it's a reproduction of what you believe subconsciously that you deserve and what's possible for your life. Most people operate out of their personal history, out of their memory, things they've done, things they've experienced, things they've seen, things that they have observed. What I'm suggesting that you operate out of a larger vision of yourself. I want you to see yourself doing what you want to do, experiencing what you want to experience, it, having what you want to have, doing what it is that gives your life some meaning and value. Operate out of your imagination, not your memory. Because whenever you look at where you want to go, I'm wanting to warn you, you will have some conversation back here after you go through the data that you've experienced in life saying you can't do it. And so what you want to begin to do is ignore that inner conversation. Well, most people, ladies and gentlemen, when something happens to them, what they do is they begin to believe that that's the way it is. That's the way it's always been. And they can't see the possibility of it being any different. Example. Before April 1954, the common belief, the universal belief, because it had been tried again and again and again and people had failed, the belief was that man was not physically capable of breaking the four-minute barrier, that he could not run a mile in less than four minutes. That was the belief on the planet. It had never been done. But here's what happened, ladies and gentlemen. Roger Bannister came along and he broke the four-minute barrier. Now here's what's significant about that. Since that time, up to this day, over 20,000 people have done it, including high school kids. What changed? 20,000 people, what changed? Here's what happened when they got on the track. They knew it had been done. And because they knew it had been done, there was a new belief 
about this barrier, about this goal that was unreachable. And those 20,000 people got in the race believing, knowing in their heart that someone had done it, that it's possible that they could do it. And I'm saying that if you know anybody that had some goal, some dream, something they wanted to do, and they did it, then I'm saying that you know in your heart that if someone has done it, then you can do it. It's possible. And that if someone can make their dream become a reality, that it's, it's possible that you can make your dream become reality. And so as you begin to look at where you want to go, beginning to embrace that, it's possible. I'm blessed and highly favored. I've got a lot going for me. I've got some good stuff in me. And it's possible that I can bring my greatness out here in the universe. That I can do what I want to do. It's possible I can write my own book. I can have my own business. I, I can take the trip and travel around the world. It's possible I can bounce back from adversity and reinvent my life. It's possible, regardless of where I am, that things can get better for me. It's possible. And I'm thinking about two men right here in Chicago who are fairly successful, similar background, educated. They worked for a corporation for many years, and they were among many people that were laid off. Two guys who were very good friends. One went out looking for a job for several weeks, along with the other one, and they faced disappointment and rejection again and again and again. They couldn't find any work, which is the story of many people across this country. One guy stopped. He became discouraged. He stopped going. He stayed home looking at television, became very argumentative and toxic with his wife, drinking beer, getting on the phone, talking to his other negative unemployed friends. <laughs> and he just gave up. The other guy kept looking for a job everywhere he could go, every time he could get an opportunity. Kept asking people, networking, checking the newspapers every day. Kept going everywhere he could, trying to find a job. You have too much education, you're overqualified, you won't be here long enough. He kept going, he kept going. He went to a place and said, look here, I tell you what, if you can't hire me, and I know you can use my talents, abilities, and skills, I don't want to sit home and do nothing. Just, just let me do some volunteer work. You don't have to give me anything, all right? I just want to work. I want to be busy. Guy said, okay, it's on you now, but don't, don't expect me to give you anything. It's okay. This guy came in and worked. He was the first one there. The last one to leave was the best employee there. About four weeks later, one of the top managers quit. They were looking for a replacement. Guess who they selected? This other guy. This guy who was volunteering his time, he got the job. What was the difference between the two men? Eyesight and mind sight. Eyesight is judging on what you see, judging according to appearances. But mind sight is how you interpret what you see. One guy said, it's not possible, it's over, I'm finished. I can't do it. I can't make it. He surrendered. I've faced rejection again and again. I'm not going anymore. There are no jobs out there. But this other guy, he felt that in spite of the no's and rejections, in spite of how bad the economy is, in spite of what the newspapers are saying, that it's possible that somebody somewhere will give me a job. He just kept going, thinking it was possible. And guess what, ladies and gentlemen? That's what we have to do with our dreams. Because things happen to you in life that you can never, ever anticipate. And many times when those things happen, you want to give up. I remember when I was in broadcasting, when I was a disc jockey, I became very controversial, not only being a disc jockey, but I felt that radio was something that you not only entertain people with, but you also empower them, you educate them. And I got fired. I didn't just leave, they fired me. <laughs> that was a shock. I said, wait a minute. They took my microphone. I thought that was who I was. No, no, ladies and gentlemen, it wasn't. I had to do something else. And I didn't know what else I could do. 
See, here's what I'm looking at. What are the uses for your life right now that you haven't even reached for yet? See, I believe that when you don't have enough encouragement to act on your dreams or ideas or you're not enlightened enough, that life will act on you. See, life had moved on me and said, Les Brown, you have outgrown this. It's time for you to do something else. Well, I wasn't enlightened enough. I organized some disc jockeys and got my job back. <laughs> so they had to find me again. <laughs> I got fired twice. Here's what I did. I had to think of something else. And so a guy suggested to me, he said, Les, why don't, why don't you run for office? I said, man, I've never run for office. I've never known anything about how to operate in the political arena. I've heard encourage people to register to vote and get out to vote, but I don't know anything about politics. He said, neither do the people who run for office all the time. <laughs> So I ran. Now here's what I'm suggesting. I ran. You got to do what you can where you are with what you have. I didn't have any money. I didn't know anything about the political process. I didn't even have any support. But here's what the guy told me. It's possible you could win. That's all I had. I was running against an endorsed candidate. He was an incumbent. He had the newspaper support, all of the leadership in the community, and I was challenging this guy. So I had a saying when I was on radio, stand up for what you believe in because you can fall for anything. And I would go door to door. I had my kids on one side of the street. I would be on the other, and I'd, I'd knock on doors. Hello, my name is Les Brown. Tell everybody I'm still standing. They get on the phone. Child Les Brown was to my house today. You know the boy on the radio with the big mouth? Yeah, they found him, honey. <laughs> Say, he's still standing. See, I'm saying, just, just keep moving. Don't start feeling sorry for yourself. Don't spend time blaming and talking about what happened to you. See, whatever you talk about, that's what you multiply and expand in your life experience. So don't talk about stuff unless you want it to keep on happening to you, all right? So I got in that kind of action. As I continue to do that, had my children with me, were going door to door, didn't have enough money. Eventually, we got close to the election and something happened that really surprised me. Guys who I thought were going to either support me or stay out of it, various powerful community leaders, they became involved in it and they endorsed my opponent. I felt devastated. Now that's going to happen to you when you're working on your dream. Things are going to happen that's going to catch you on the blind side. That was shocking to me. They didn't have to do that. All they had to do was just stay out of it. But here they go, come up in there messing with me. Now that's going to happen. There's some people who believe it's their personal business to stop you from living your dream, all right? <laughs> but I didn't deal with that. You want to make your dream come true, you got to stay focused. Some people rather get even than get ahead. Stay focused on where you want to go. I just kept on doing what I was supposed to do. And so I was driving to the radio station, my opponent had over $20,000. I had less than $800. As I was in the radio station, the guy said, you're going to make a commercial? I said, yes. He said, it better be a good one because that money can't go pretty far here. <laughs> and I sat there in the middle control room and I was thinking, and here's what happens when you get still. Stuff will start coming. Something said, call your mama. You used to talk about your mother on the air all the time. Ask her to say a few words for you. That'll be a different kind of political spot. <laughs> so I called my mama, and I had a, a, a gospel record playing in the background. <laughs> and then I had my mother say, hello, this is Mrs. Mamie Brown. When I raised my sons, I raised them to be good children. When they got out of hand, I beat their behind and made them go right. Please vote for my son. He's a good boy. <laughs> Usually in the state representative race, maybe three or 4,000 people will come out to vote in a primary. In that primary race, over 27,000 people came out and voted and said, I'm voting for Les Brown because his mama said he's a good boy. <laughs> I won, ladies and gentlemen. 
I won. So you've got to be willing to stay focused, to be creative, to be relentless, because things are going to happen to you when you're working on your dream. When you get on track, I remember when I first got involved in speaking, one of the main things that speakers like to do is speak to, speak to a certain association that they have over 10,000 of their sales reps that come to this convention. And I was relentless. I kept saying, it's possible. It's possible. See, what I want to let you know and set you up for, because you said it's possible, don't mean that you're not going to have any problems. <laughs> that Murphy's Law ain't going to come and slap you side the head. Old Murphy gonna come visit you. He's waiting for some of y'all out in the parking lot. <laughs> oh, you say it's possible. Okay, it's possible. You better get up. <laughs> well, I was working. I kept saying it's possible. They got other speakers on this program. I can be on that program too. I kept selling myself. I got all fired up. And I was calling him every day, every day. And the lady finally said, Mr. Brown, I tell you what. We want you to come in and talk to our sales executives. you got the kind of fire and guts that they want that will motivate them. And let me tell you something else. We want you to bring your motivational tapes. You're going to need at least $50,000 worth of tapes. I said, is that right? Yes, because they want to keep that drive alive. I said, all right. I called the guy to duplicate my tapes. I said, Don, how are you doing? This is Les. Let me tell you, i got a major speaking engagement. I said, man, it's a speaker's dream. I need over $50,000 worth of product. He said, Les, you don't have that kind of credit. I said, I know, but Don, I can sell that. Just, just right after speaking engagement, I'll give you money in four days. He said, are you sure, Les? I said, yes, but I got a major speaking engagement, and they told me to do it. He said, man, that, that's a big order. Let me talk with the lady with you. I said, hold on just a minute, man. Call the lady back. Hello, Evelyn, how you doing? This is Les Brown. I got Don on the phone. What did you say? Do I have the speaking engagement? Yes, you do. And, and what else you suggest? Les, our, our people, they buy a lot of tapes. Your tapes are very popular among them. I'm saying bring at least $50,000 worth of tapes, Les. You'll sell everything you got and more. I said, did you hear that, Don? He said, yes. I said, now, if anybody else has to make a decision, are you the final person? She said, I'm the final person. I will send you the contract. I want you. I said, did you hear that, Don? He said, yes. I said, oh, ye of little faith. I said, duplicate the tapes, man. Hunk the phone up. Well, he duplicated the tapes. One week came by. I'm checking the mail every day. No contract. I said, come on, Murphy, don't start now, man. Come on. Come on, man, give me a break. Come on, now, you know. This ain't fair. Come on, man. Give me a break. Come on. I talked to myself, you know. I didn't want to call him right now. Two weeks passed by. Murphy said, don't you think you ought to call him? <laughs> I said, okay. I called, I said, hello, uh, this is Les Brown calling. How you doing, Les? I said, fine. I said, um, Evelyn hasn't sent my contract out yet. Any additional information you need? So, Les, you haven't heard? I said, no. I said, Evelyn died. I said, she died? I said, did she say anything about me? <laughs> when I got home, I was so wiped out. And Murphy was in the house waiting on me. <laughs> Murphy said, is it possible you want to listen to some of your tapes? <laughs> what I had to do. I had to begin to focus on what was the solution. That this was not the only place that I'd be able to sell those products. And as I began to challenge myself and got some help and support and some other input, I eventually did. It took longer, but it was challenging. But I did it. Repeat after me, please. No matter how bad it is, or how bad it gets, I'm going to make it. I'm going, I'm going to make it. Shake somebody's hand on your right and left and say, you got that right.
Repeat after me, please. It's possible. It's possible. I can have my dream. I can, have my dream. I can get what I want. I must be creative and never give up. Now, let me share something else with you, ladies and gentlemen. When you know within yourself that there's something you want to do, and I believe that all of us were born with a purpose, that all of us have something that we are supposed to do, that all of us have some goodness within us, and that goodness gives us a responsibility to manifest our greatness. And when you know that, you can feel it in your guts, and you know that you're deliberately operating below your potential, you've gotten comfortable, you stop expanding, you stop stretching, you stop challenging yourself. Let me share something else with you. Not only is it possible for you to have your dream, but it's necessary. It's necessary that you have it, that you work on it, that you develop yourself, that you go for what is yours in the universe. I have a friend that at the beginning of the year I was in Los Angeles giving a speech and and I do a seminar teaching people how to become involved in the speaking business and, and also one called Speaking with Power, teaching people how to begin to develop their communication skills. And this friend, I said, I want you to work with me. I called her up. She said, Les, are you sure I can do it? Sure you can. You have a PhD in communications. I don't have that. If I can do it, sure you can do it. In fact, I'm going to give you the support that you need. Here's what I realize, ladies and gentlemen. We only have enough energy to take us to a certain level, but it's necessary that we assemble ourselves with other people who share our vision, other people that can see it for us, to give ourselves a home court advantage. So it's necessary that you seek out other people who think like you who are growing, who have decided that they are not satisfied with where they are. See, I don't believe that, the necessity, that necessity is the mother invention of invention. No. Necessity, in my opinion, is not the mother of invention. Refusing to accept things the way that they are is the mother of invention. When you decide, I'm not going to settle for this, this is not going to be it for my life. I deserve more than this. See, that will start making you do some stuff. See, a lot of people go to work every day miserable, and all they do is just talk about how miserable they are. But they don't do anything about it. So I was telling her that I knew she hated a job with a passion. I said, you can do this. You've got more going for you than I have going for me. And we've been going through this for years, ladies and gentlemen. She'd been to my seminar speaking for a living. She brought her husband, and that was one of the major problems that I realized that happened in her life. He couldn't see it for her. So you've got to make sure that you have people in your life that can see it for you, that will encourage you. Non-affirming relationships can hurt you. And I talked to him. I said, you know, I don't have anything to do with, with your marriage. He said, you and I are good friends, and she and I are good friends. And, and I'm not taking sides. I said, but if you can't see it for it, don't tell her that. Just give her some support. What if you're wrong? It's possible, man, that, that if, if I'm doing it, she can do it. Well, you're different. How are you going to tell me that? You've seen her speak. She's got great speaking skills. Don't underestimate her. You don't know. You've got a great woman here. But you see, people who can't see it for themselves, can't see it for you. He was happy. So I said, will you do it with me? I said, I'm going to give you the support you need. You can't do it by yourself. I will stand with you. She said, you will? I said, yes. I'm going to make you part of my seminar. You'll do a part of it and I'll do a part of it. Speaking with power. She said, okay. Three days later, ladies and gentlemen, I got an emergency call at my office. It was from a husband. He called and said, tell Les Brown that Marion is dead. I said, oh no. When I was flying there to go to the funeral, and I remember the last time that I saw her, and I had some of her papers that I had gotten inadvertently confused with mine, and I took them home. And I was searching through these papers to do one of her works. She was a prolific writer. 
And what got me, what was so sad that made me begin to cry was that there were poems that she had started that were profound poems, great thoughts, that she didn't complete. Plays that she had started that she didn't complete. See, that poem was given to her. I can't finish that for her, nor can you. That play, whatever the outcome that she had envisioned, that she had imagined, was given to her. Only her. And that, she's the channel that that was going to come through. You are here and you are the vessel, you are the outlet for the universe, that you've been selected, there's something for you to do. I believe all of us have some purpose for being here. And as I was going to the funeral, and I was reading a newspaper that said that, that millions of people are dying because of, of what they're eating, talking about their diet. And I'm sure that it, it was Marion talking to me, whispering, saying, Les, the next time you speak, so that even more are dying because of what's eating them.